Number five, Goblin Shark. Under the sea is where nature starts to really let its creative juices flow. It's just an abstract world of tentacles, feelers, and razor sharp teeth down there. Like a Jackson Pollock, but for things that'll bite you. I know that little crab said it's better down where it's wetter, but I just don't know if I agree if things like the goblin shark are swimming around freely. I know that sounds kind of like I have a strong opinion about these things, and I do. The goblin shark is probably one of the scariest looking living creatures on the planet. The translucent skin really isn't helping matters. I mean, seriously. Google, try and find a cute photo of one of these things, even a little baby. Every single picture of it makes it look like something H.R. Giger would look at and think, hmm, maybe tone it down a bit. The goblin shark gets its name from its grotesque appearance. Sorry to all our goblin shark viewers, it's nothing personal. Its elongated nose and its unique unhinged jaws full of nail-like teeth. That nose isn't just for show either. It actually serves as a little prey detector for the goblin shark. The nose is filled with electroreceptors that allow it to pick up tiny electric fields of prey. It sneaks around the seabed using that little food finder to sniff out its next meal. Electrically charged tracking sharks with monstrous teeth. Wasn't that literally a joke in one of the Austin Powers movies? Goblin sharks actually can't even close their mouths fully with their teeth always being visible just to let you know what they're packing. I think as a general rule of thumb, you should stay away from any creature scientifically named after a goblin. That's advice that has done me well, that's advice that has served Spider-Man well, and I am passing that on to you. Having a good time so far? It would really make my day if you tossed a little old subscribe our way. Number four, the Pacific Black Dragon. Now, this is an entry I could probably include solely on a name basis. You wouldn't even need to see a picture of it, and you just trust that the Pacific Black Dragon is a scary looking fish. However, I'm a visual learner, and you're watching a YouTube video, so we're going to include several pictures of one of Mother Nature's most precious little abhorrent monstrosities. Take a look at this thing. You would be forgiven for thinking that this thing popped out of that one guy's chest in Alien, because it looks way more like a chest burster than it does a fish. And for those keeping track at home, that's my second reference to the 1979 sci-fi classic, and it probably won't be the last in this video. This angry little noodle, occasionally referred to as the Black Sea Dragon, gets its name from the fact that its skin absorbs 99.95% of the light in its habitat, which happens to be anywhere from 1,600,000 feet to 6,000 feet below the depths. Meaning this thing is dark. It hides in plain sight in the pitch black water, letting the bait hanging from its chin attract prey. Smaller fish swim up to what they think is something appetizing, and then the last thing they ever see is two beady little glowing eyes and then nothing. While this little fish is one of the smallest monsters on our list, I don't trust a fish that learned how to fish. There's something traitorous about that behavior. And honestly, maybe it's shallow, but I just can't move on from how truly horrifying this thing looks. I'm vapid, I can admit that. And I would love to see the Megalodon snarf this thing up. Number three, Japanese spider crab. How do spiders manage to get into everything? Doesn't matter where you are, you will find a spider crawling around in your apartment, up your shower, on your walls, on the toilet seat. I thought we would have been safe at least in the ocean, but I really should have known better. Introducing the Japanese spider crab, a creature pulled directly from my nightmares in my therapy sessions. These things look like they crawled out of the dankest depths and can grow up to 12 feet long. They can grow up to be 40 pounds, and if somehow one of its many legs gets severed, they can just regrow those no problem when they molt next. They're not just one of the longest crabs in the world, they also have possibly the longest lifespan of any crab, with a spider crab living to up to 100 years old. You're telling me there's a crabby long legs walking around out there who was born in the 20s, still kicking about on the ocean floor? moving his little bowler hat, spinning his little crabby cane. Now a little bit of cursory digging taught me two things about the spider crab to put my fears on ice. Apparently these monsters, despite their outward appearance, are completely benevolent and are more content to scavenge around the ocean floor looking for scraps than they are ever likely to interact with a human and are actually considered to be quite lazy by crab standards. Apparently they taste amazing and are considered a delicacy in some parts of Japan. I know for me, a key part of exposure therapy and getting over any of my fears is to eat my fears slathered in a buttery reduction, uh, prepared over rice, maybe with a nice soy sauce. I'm looking at more pictures and maybe I was totally wrong about the Japanese spider crab. I'm also very tall in a way that concerns people and I'm very lazy, usually scavenging for my next meal as well. Although I am hoping that my next meal is a spider crab sushi combo. Number two, Stargazer. 
The stargazer is a fish that's got a face only mother nature could love and even then it looks like she might not be that generous. This thing kind of looks like if you buried a pug up to its face and then left it out in the sun for a few months. I don't think it's even too much of a stretch to say this might very well be the ugliest fish on the planet. Now it's not a crime to be the ugliest fish on the planet, and you certainly wouldn't make a list of terrifying creatures just for being a little bit ugly. The stargazer earned its place on this list for also being one of the meanest fishes out there. Oh, it's always the ones you least expect. The stargazer has defensive capabilities that make it sound a lot more like it's a Pokemon than a fish. These things will bury themselves in the ocean floor, turning themselves into a little trap and then using their massive mouths as a vacuum and sucking their unsuspecting prey right up. And if that wasn't enough of an evolutionary selling point for you, the stargazer also has electric organs at the top of it which transmit electric shocks to predators. That's a nasty little guy. And the name stargazer comes from the fact that when it's burrowing, it buries itself down and the only thing peering out is its ugly little eyes peering upwards at the sky or the stars. I gotta say, I got absolutely no love for these things. I like that they're very ugly, that's charming, but the rest of it, no. They're like scaly little zappy landmines. Number one, Portuguese man o' war. Of all the things on this list, the Portuguese man o' war seems like it's the most not from this planet. It looks beautifully ethereal, like something you'd see floating around in the background in a Star Wars planet or maybe hanging out with the blue things from Avatar. It's a truly cosmic looking wonder of nature. However, it is anything but. The first clue should be the fact that it is named after a 17th century battleship. It looks a bit like a jellyfish, but in actuality, it's a strange little colonial organism made up of smaller organisms called zooids. See, th this already sounds like I'm talking about an alien, a zooid. You gonna look me in the eyes and tell me a zooid is real? This thing actually isn't even an animal per se, but three organisms in a trench coat trying to sneak into the movies. The main zooid is a gas-filled translucent sac, which coincidentally is uh, what my 10th grade gym teacher used to call me to motivate me to run around the track faster. The gas-filled sac allows the colony to float. The man of war has no means of movement, instead having to rely on the currents of the ocean to direct it around. Real go with the flow type of an organism. Not a bad attitude, to be honest. Now the next zooid, oh, <laughs> I am never gonna get used to saying that are the tentacles, which are really the star of the show here. The tentacles on a man of war reach lengths of up to 165 feet. Now I'll run that by you in case you heard that, fainted, and didn't quite catch what I said. Get up off the floor. Their tentacles can get up to 165 feet long. That's really long. The tentacles, which mind you, carry a sting like a jellyfish's. It's been known to cause paralysis, is enough to kill a fish, and has been on some occasions enough to be lethal to humans. One Redditor recounts a painful story of a vacation to Cuba, strolling a beach and seeing what they thought was a plastic bag floating in the water. They then went to pick it up and as they described, the next thing I knew, I woke up in the hospital in a vinegar bath with a morphine drip, a team of doctors extracting the tentacles that were stuck into my hand. That's enough to keep me away from the water for a bit and maybe uh, prevent myself from ever doing a good deed, try to pick up some litter. I feel like even the Megalodon might want to be careful around this strange monster. Coming in at number five, we have Colossal Squid. The Colossal Squid, which is not seen by many humans unless they have washed up on shore, they are considered to be the largest and heaviest squid species in the sea, weighing a total of 1,500 pounds and having a length of 33 feet long, as well as being the most elusive and mysterious creatures of the deep sea. The species were first discovered in 1925 when two Colossal Squid arms were found in a sperm whale stomach. Then in 1981, another one was discovered, and finally in 2003, the colossal squid was collected for further research of this new and crazy species of squid. But to this day, very little is known about this deep sea creature. These squids are also known to have the largest eyes out of the entire animal kingdom, being larger than a human head. Unlike other squid species have hooks on their arms, which are very muscular and strongly attached to their arms, and it's said these hook-like things are used to help the squid hold and emerge mobilized struggling prey. Sounds like a horror movie death to me. Due to them being so far down in the sea, little is known about them and their behaviors, but what is known is that they prey on sperm whales. Yes, these creatures are fearless. They see a massive whale and say that's breakfast, which is terrifying. Only a few have been caught and those couple that have been, have been put on display at the Museum of New Zealand in December 2008. So if you're planning a trip to New Zealand, I would definitely suggest going to see this massive specimen because the likelihood of you coming into contact with this squid 
unmotivated while swimming is slim to none. But then again, why would you ever want to get close to this thing while going for a swim? Coming in at number four, we have Atlantic Wolfish. The Atlantic Wolfish comes with a lot of nicknames, otherwise known as the Atlantic Catfish, Sea Cat, Wolf Eel, Ocean Catfish, Sea Wolf, and the most fitting, the Devil Fish. Their blue like appearance makes them stand out from many of the other fish species in the deep sea. Besides their unique appearance, wolfish actually naturally produce antifreeze to keep their blood flowing due to their extremely cold environment. One good thing about these scary creatures is that they help control the crab and sea urchin populations, which tend to get out of hand quickly and can have a negative effect on the health of a marine system. They have several fang like teeth in the front, followed by three more rows of teeth inside their powerful and crushing jaws. Even their throats are armed with serrated teeth. If that's not terrifying enough, they can grow as long as a fully grown human is tall, so about six feet give or take. Their diets consist of large hermit crabs, starfish, crustaceans, large whelks, and sea urchins. These hideous creatures are known for their quick strikes and even quicker kills because being a part of the deep sea community is a fish eat fish world down there, and thankfully we are safe from them up here on land. In fact, the numbers of Atlantic wolfish in the US are actually depleting due to the overfishing, and according to the National Marine Fisheries Service, they are currently considered a species of concern. If you're an avid fisher in the Atlantic Ocean, try to steer clear from these creatures and let them do their own thing. Come in at number three, deep sea dragonfish. This is probably one of the ugliest fish I've ever seen, which is why it fits perfectly on this list, and that is the deep sea dragonfish. Sometimes referred to as the scaleless dragonfish, this hideous creature looks like something straight out of a horror movie with its sharp, transparent teeth, slimy skin, and enormous mouth, which can open more than 100 degrees. Even though it's not the biggest creature of the deep sea, that doesn't stop it from eating prey 50 times its size, and that is beyond scary. This creature's teeth are stronger than the teeth of some of the fiercest fish predators, like piranhas and even great white sharks. The dragonfish is a ferocious predator and can actually produce its own light through a chemical process known as bioluminescence. But when he's not hunting prey, he can easily disappear into the darkness of the deep sea and lurk in his habitat, 1,600 feet under the surface of the ocean. The deep sea is the darkest and deepest corner of the ocean with crushing pressure and lack of oxygen and light, it makes it extremely difficult for anything to survive down there. Thankfully, this predator is deep, deep, deep down in the ocean, and hopefully none of us will ever come in contact with this hideous water monster. Coming in at number two, we have Frilled Shark. The frilled shark is often called the living fossil due to its appearance, looking like a massive prehistoric eel. They have a dark brown exterior and are almost seven feet long. These creatures are terrifying due to their 40 rows of curved, razor-sharp teeth, which is a total of about 300 teeth. First discovered in 1876 by zoologist Ludwig Dodelin, who classified this creature as a discrete species of shark, and a few years later, after much research, it was later named its own species in the shark family. Given a name, because of its frilly looking gills, and today there are two different types of species of the frilled shark. Regardless of how many species there are, I don't want to come in contact with any of them. This creature tends to live in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans and don't tend to come into contact with humans, but a handful of times they have been accidentally caught by commercial fishermen. Thankfully, you probably will never come into contact with this terrifying creature because the closest they've come to the ocean surface is 390 feet deep, but typically they reside more than three times times that depth. They live very close to the ocean floor and survive off of cephalopods, bony fish, and smaller sharks. When hunting for food, these creatures move similar to an eel, lunging and bending to capture their prey and continue to swallow them whole with their long and flexible jaws and of course their massive amounts of teeth. Due to the creatures living in the deep sea, they are rarely seen and for good reasons, but there was rare footage that came out in 2007 of one. If you're not too scared, you can go check it out after this video. And finally, in at number one, we have stonefish. They are known to live in the tropical Pacific and Indian Oceans, and these deep sea creatures have perfect camouflage to look like a rock on the floor of a coral reef. So even if you somehow were around one, you probably wouldn't even notice it was a fish. They are close relatives to the scorpion fishes and consume other reef fishes and some seafloor invertebrates. They don't actively hunt their prey, they just wait for their prey to come to them, waiting hours at a time. And when their potential target is less than their body length away, they will strike. They have some of the most powerful jaws and 
very large mouths that create so much pressure they are able to easily trap their unsuspecting prey and swallow them whole. This creature is the most venomous fish in the world. It has 13 spines along its back that can release the venom and this can kill a human within a few hours. They have a potent neurotoxin secreted from glands at the base of their needle like dorsal fin spines which they stick up when disturbed or threatened. The more venom that is injected into you the worse it will be. Their stings cause terrible pain, swelling, necrosis and then of course death. These horrifying creatures are actually considered a delicacy in many parts of Asia such as Japan and China. They are usually cooked ginger and put into a clear soup but could also be served raw as sashimi. As long as they are prepared correctly and their dorsal fins are removed, they are a dense and sweet snack and considered by many to be good for your health. If you are swimming in the ocean you thankfully won't come in contact with this killer fish creature because they live on the ocean floor so you won't have to worry, but if you are curious about the stonefish you can check out more about it on the show River Monsters. They did an episode in 2017. Even though the stonefish isn't the largest creature in the deep sea, it's their venom that makes them the most terrifying. They don't use their venom to catch prey but it's quite effective when they are threatened and can turn away even the strongest potential predators. Number 5. The Kraken over the port side boy, star she blows, butter down the hatches, the kraken's air. I'm sorry, I absolutely could not resist. I'm just trying to paint you a picture of the scene here. The kraken is an absolutely legendary sea monster, harking back to old sailors tales from the 17th century. It started as an old Nordic legend and was said to haunt the waters from Norway through Iceland. But as its legend grew, stories of the kraken would be passed throughout the world carrying on from sea to shining sea. It's widely theorized that the legend of the kraken began with sightings of the colossal squid, a creature almost as mythical as the kraken itself. An old fisherman's tale, it's depicted as a colossal cephalopod capable of crushing a fully stacked galleon with its tentacles and bringing it down to the ocean floor. If the tentacles and its heaving beak aren't enough, it also creates whirlpools around it as it drags your doomed ship down with it all the way down to Davy Jones's locker. The Kraken probably has one of the best PR agents in the sea monster community, being the subject of stories, songs for centuries, finding its way into numerous movies, a career making role in Clash of the Titans, a very strong supporting role in the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise really helped elevate it to stardom, even finding its way into a bunch of video games over the years, serving as a boss for players in God of War, Sea of Thieves, and for the real OGs out there, RuneScape as well. When it comes down to who could defeat who, it's not even a question. The Megalodon wouldn't get so much as 30 seconds with the Kraken. The Kraken of lore was crushing ships in seconds. You think it's even gonna notice crushing a shark? Number 4. The Loch Ness Monster now, The Loch Ness Monster is probably the most famous sea creature of all time, and probably one of the most famous Scottish things of all time, alongside William Wallace, Kilts, and Haggis. It's also one of the world's oldest recurring cryptid stories, with the first reports of Nessie going all the way back to the year 565. And since then, Nessie has delighted cryptozoologists the world over, becoming a cultural icon for Scotland and the Loch Ness as a whole. There's been several, several concentrated efforts to really find the Loch Ness Monster over the years. And while nothing has ever officially shown up on a sonar or a radar, that has never stopped the stream of sightings and photos of the Loch's gentle giant. Nessie seems pretty benevolent. There's never been a story or an allegation of the Loch Ness Monster eating or hurting anyone, usually just sticking its cute little head out of the water for a quick little blurry candid to be discussed and analyzed for years. Let's talk serious for a second here. In the ring, squaring up in a 1v1, I've absolutely got Nessie over the Megalodon, easy. That long neck is going to wrap around the Meg, get that thing lassoed. You know, the Meg is big, sure. But the Loch Ness Monster clearly has some stealth capabilities. I mean, it's been eluding capture for the better part of 1,500 years, so I've got to imagine that Nessie's got to know some pretty good tricks for hiding. But more so than anything, Nessie's got the people of Scotland riding for them. You're not just messing with a sea creature, Megalodon. You are messing with a beloved cultural icon. It would be like going to war against raccoons in Toronto. The people just won't stand for it. Number 3. Umbozu, translating to Sea Priest, is a yokai appearing in Japanese folklore. It's depicted as a large, shadowy figure looming out of the water, appearing to sailors, breaking the ship as it rises, and demanding a bucket from whatever unlucky sailor happens to cross its path. Maybe it's got a leak in the roof. There's some differing opinions on what the origin of the Umabozu is, as there's no specific origin to its legacy or one tale we can point towards. But it's generally agreed that the origin is that they are the spirits of priests who were thrown into the ocean by villagers for one reason or another, 
And because these priests have had nowhere to lay their bodies to rest, their spirits inhabit the ocean and take the form of a dark specter, haunting and taking retribution on unfortunate souls in the waters. I'd never heard about this creature until researching it for this video, and I've got to say it has got some fantastic folklore. You really should do yourself a favor and look up Umabozu after. The Umabozu rising from the sea and asking if you've got a bucket for it is hilarious. Like it's more of an annoying roommate than a sea monster asking if it can borrow something. Folklore says the Umabozu would cling onto the hull of the ship and shriek at the sailors, sinking them down. The Umabozu's weakness? The smell of smoke, apparently. So if you're looking to get rid of one, light some sage up, I guess, or light something. I'm sure that's very easy to do when you're on a wooden boat in the water. Now, squaring up against the Megalodon. This one, I actually do feel like it could go either way. The Megalodon, giant shark, Umabozu, scary specter. But I am gonna give the edge to Umabozu solely because I don't know if it's got an actual tangible physical form or if it's just a shadow monster. You know, Megalodon can't really bite through shadows, I don't think. I don't think that's one of its powers. As well, I could really see Umabozu pulling that little trick, you know, hanging on to the side of the Meg, asking for a bucket, and then the Megalodon, who presumably doesn't speak any languages, not understanding what's happening, gets dragged down to the bottom of the sea, never to be seen again. Number two, Skyla and Carabitus. Skyla and Carabitus are sort of like a wrestling tag team duo as far as mythical sea monsters go. They worked in tandem, hounding opposite sides of a narrow strait of water, and famously clashed with the Argo Odysseus, made famous in Homer's Odyssey. The first beast, Skyla, was described to be a dragon-like creature, having 12 feet, six long necks, and atop each neck was a head full of razor-sharp teeth. Sailors unlucky enough to pass through Skyla's territory were swooped from their vessel and swallowed whole before they'd even know what would happen. That doesn't sound so bad, you know, all in an instant. There's some speculation that perhaps the original Skyla was a very dramatized account of sailing through an underwater reef, which would definitely provide some explanation as to why a writhing mass of limbs and teeth would be shredding through a ship's hull. But Skyla is only one half of this dynamic duo, the Robin to Batman, and the other half is Carabitus. Carabitus is a little harder to describe, as it has no agreed appearance. In the original myth, the Odyssey, Carabitus presents itself as a whirlpool, savagely swirling around, creating the tides and pulling passing ships into their doom. Maybe it's just a little camera shy and it lets its more Handsome sibling, take a lot of the front-facing business. However, of the two, it could be argued that Carabitus was the more dangerous of the two, as during the Odyssey, Odysseus chose to sail his ship closer to Skyla than Carabitus, figuring that it was wiser to lose six men to lose the entire ship. Very wise guy. Now, the Megalodon. Drop out of this one before you even try. A one-on-one -on -one is one thing, but a duo battle against a whirlpool and a six-headed dragon? Save yourself the embarrassment and just clock out and go home. Number 1. Jormagander. Jormagander is another old Nordic sea legend, also known as the Midgard Serpent or the World Serpent, and is a serpent so large that its tail would surround the circumference of the earth and all its oceans and loop back around onto itself inside its mouth, creating an Ouroboros. This impressive girth is where the creature gets its name, World Serpent. Jormagander's also had a bit of a star-studded run in pop culture, appearing in Marvel Comics and most recently the new God of War, based around Nordic legends. Jormagander is fairly central to Nordic mythology, as it was said that when the creature would stop biting its own tail and release it from its jaws, it would be one of the signs of Ragnarok, and the creature would thrash its tail and the seas would rise up and flood Midgard, the Nordic term for their realm. There are several notable myths detailing Thor's many encounters with Jormagander, and his various attempts to overpower the beast and to slay the mighty serpent, although as the myths go, he was never quite successful. Good for me, because I actually don't think I would do too great in Ragnarok. I'm really not much of a fighter, and I don't think I would do well wrestling any Vikings. It's said that when Ragnarok occurs, Thor will slay the mighty serpent, only to find himself defeated by poison from the creature himself. All of this to say is that as far as sea monsters go, there could not possibly be anyone more powerful in lore than Jormagander. All this beast has to do to initiate the end of the world is to take its tail out of its mouth. The Megalodon wouldn't be able to challenge this thing. It would literally be over before it began. The Jormagander opens its mouth to start the duel, and that's it. It's done. Not only is the Megalon done, but everything's done. Seas flooding, fires raining down from the heavens. How could there possibly be a more powerful sea monster than this? 
unless they update the Nordic myths at all, I doubt anything will ever tap the legend of the Jormungandr. Number 5. Rose Veiled Fairy Rass The Sea Finny Fenma was spotted by John Randall in the early 1990s and was initially thought to be just an adult version of C. rubris quamus, a fish from the Maldives. However, just a couple months ago, a new strain of species was finally caught and analyzed. Though there have been hundreds of fish caught off the coast of the Maldives, this colorful, mesmerizing new addition is the first ever to be formally introduced and recognized as a brand new species. All right. Welcome to Earth, little buddy. I love this planet. Every day there's something new, eh? This thing is mesmerizing, right? Look at it. It's just so beautiful. Apparently it changes colors as it grows up too. Different year, different color. The rose-veiled fairy wrasses is one of the first species to have its name derived from the local Dhivehi language with Finifenma meaning rose, a nod to both its beautiful pink hues and the island's national flower. Ah, we're starting this list off nice and easy. Imagine swimming with these. This is beautiful. Nice little rainbow around you. Of course, us being us. This species being so new and abundant has started making it, of course, at high risk of over exploitation. Yeah, don't forget what we do to fish. Yeah, humans can be the worst for this planet also. Already talks of commercialization, tasty new dishes, and exotic deep sea tanks before it's even got a scientific name. That should be a metaphor about how we are. You know? Something so new and precious and we're already craving over it. The beauty of nature, I guess. The discovery is part of the California Academies of Science Hope for Reefs initiative started in 2016 by a team of marine biologists and deep sea divers. It was created to explore, explain, and sustain the world's coral reefs by making fundamental breakthroughs in coral reef biology. That's awesome, dude. Okay, so there's like some pure people still out there trying to help. That's beautiful. All right. One for humanity. Okay, we're trying here. Number four, the blanket octopus. The blanket octopus gets its name from its female counterpart, the very rarely seen and supersized female blanket octopus. She has a long fleshy cape that wraps around her tentacles. This cape makes the octopus appear larger and more intimidating to predators. Though the female blanket octopus is already large growing to around two and a half meters in length, the males only grow up to about one inch weighing in at a monstrous one pound. All right. The caped female growing upwards of 40% bigger in mass and size. 40% his size. Okay, this species is much more interesting now. 40 times bigger than its counterpart? Just a little guy, you know? You got this, little man. That's like us dating a sperm whale. How does he not get lost in that big cape? Hey, soulmates are soulmates, right? In fact, the blanket octopus exhibit one of the most extreme sexual size dimorphisms known in any of the animal kingdoms. That's a really cool fact. Unique love, you know? That's like Donkey and Dragon from Shrek. But on a bleaker note, unfortunately scientists don't think that they live very long. Sad, I know. Like many other octopuses, they are short-lived at approximately one to two years for females and three to four years as males. The tiny male drifts through the ocean seeking a mate while protecting their precious reproductive arm tucked away in a sack between their mouth and eye. Males die soon after they mate, while females will continue to live and grow for many months and years longer than the males, spawning around 100,000 eggs which are carried by her under her arms. Blanket octopuses can be found in both tropical and subtropical waters. They apparently are reported to feed on seafloor mollusks and small fishes. It's not fish, eh? Yeah, it's fishes. Yeah, I, didn't, I never knew that. It's fishes. I like that. Blanket octopuses are also immune to venom, like from the Portuguese man of war, the huge jellyfish. Female blankets actually rip their limbs off and use them as weapons. They use the tentacles of jellyfish to sting other predators for both offense and defense. This is like my new favorite animal. These should be called Joan of Arcs, because that's like the energy I'm getting here. When threatened, the female unfurls her large net-like membranes that spread out like Batman's cape, making her instantly three times the size of an already 12 foot body. Hmm. Gentle giant or limb ripper offer? You tell me. Number three, the glass octopus. A rare encounter with a glass octopus has just happened, which is one of the strangest and coolest species that swim these oceans. These science fiction looking dudes have transparent gelatinous bodies and scientists believe that they have evolved into their elongated shape in order to make itself next to invisible, even when right beside it. That's pretty cool. The only colorful parts on them are their optic nerves, eyeballs, and digestive tract. Yeah, basically like a see-through Game Boy. Remember those? About like three times the size of a Game Boy 2 at about 20 inches long. It's likely that these octopuses eat whatever is down there at the depths of the twilight zone and midnight zone. Yeah, like deep, deep. And cold. 
Footage of the glass octopus is super new and before this expedition, scientists had almost no documentation of the animal in the wild. That means they've mostly had to learn about it just by studying remains found in the guts of other predators. But now, thanks to the Schmidt Ocean Institute armed with close range high def videos and pictures, scientists and biologists are now able to learn a little bit more about this mysterious ghostly creature. Quote, the ocean holds wonders and promises we haven't even imagined, much less discovered. Wendy Schmidt, co-founder of Schmidt Ocean Institute. Thanks to a recent expedition in the US Pacific remote islands, the Schmidts led a 34 day trip that brought scientists together from all around the world to document deep sea creatures on deep sea mounts. See this is what I'm talking about. All the while using a remote controlled vehicle named Sebastian. I love it. I get it, Little Mermaid, I got you. Scientists observed not one but two octopuses, adding further to more knowledge and behavior of this elusive species. The glass octopus is considered one of the least studied cephalopods in our ocean. I'm excited. Let's go 2022. So far so good. Great year for fishes. Number two, the colossal squid. Sometimes called the Antarctic squid or giant cranch squid or famously known as <gasps> The Kraken. It's believed to be the largest squid species ever. It's the only member of the Mesonicothelius genus and is only known from a handful of sightings throughout history. Ah yes, the old sea captain's log, huh? The species is confirmed to reach a mass of at least 1500 pounds, making it the largest known invertebrate on the planet. Biggest one so far is 20 meters. That's like the pitcher's mound to home plate. Yeah. This thing is massive. Though the species has similar anatomy to other squids, it's the only member to display hooks on its arms and tentacles. Okay, that's a little scary. It lives in the Antarctic and is found at depths of the twilight zone, like 2000 meters down. Little is actually known about the creature, what it eats and what it does all the way down there. Scientists say it's bioluminescence as well, which attracts prey. Look, if this thing was flying instead of swimming, just one atmosphere difference, I'm just gonna say it, this thing would be an alien. You know what I mean? I'm, I said it. I mean, no wonder it's got a reputation for swallowing up ships by pirates. The first specimens were spotted in 1925, but in the early 2000s, fishermen got lucky and they pulled up the largest colossal squid ever found. It's now on display at the Museum of New Zealand. Kind of sad that when we see these beautiful things, the first thing we think is to yank them out of the water. I like the underwater cameras and free divers blue planet style, just swimming down there with krakens. Okay, maybe not. Yank it up boys. Get it up, that thing's horrifying. And the number one spot, the blood belly comb jelly. Sounds like a magical elixir. From the family Lampictenidae, this specimen was first caught and studied by George Matsumoto, the marine biologist at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, who discovered the blood belly jelly in 2003. Now we're sure these things weren't discovered on like one of Jupiter's moons or something already in the 30s. We're sure of that. Cause that thing's blinking like a you know what. Not many of these things have actually been caught though. I've never seen anything like this before. Brilliant and then seemingly electric. The bloody belly comb jelly comes in different shades of red as well. The sparkling display on the outside comes from light reflecting and refracting off tiny transparent hair like cilia. Basically this thing is like a swimming light bright. Remember those light brights from the 90s? This thing is like the alive version of that. Of course alongside its mystic nature it also poops sparkles. Seriously, like a little alien unicorn. That's neat, right? Its name comes from its ruby red color. While it's pretty much invisible from underneath its belly, from above and in front, it lights up like the 4th of July, luring predators in with its mesmerizing patterns. Red is nearly invisible in the deep sea, so the vibrant crimson that gives the comb jelly its name is actually helping it hide. Blood bellies are technically xenophores, not true jellyfish. Many comb jellies have calloblasts lining their tentacles, which work like glue instead of venom. Upon touch, a spiral filament automatically bursts out and releases this sticky glue stuff. Once a fish is unable to swim away, the comb jelly reels in its tentacles and brings the food to its mouth. Um, okay, so this thing just became absolutely terrifying again. The deep dark sea, we gotta respect it. How insects and how jellyfish eat scares the out of me. I just I can't explain it. Watch it for yourself. <laughs>